This is a look at the skeletal system, gross anatomy. The skeletal system is going to provide a framework. Without skeletons, muscles can't move the body. They act as levers. And the components of the skeletal system are going to be the bones, the cartilage, the ligaments, which hold bone to bone, and the tendons, which hold muscle to bone. And there's other various relationships among bones and soft tissues. Now, some of the terms that you're going to have to know are going to be um, the body, which is the main part, the head, which is an enlarged end, a neck, which is a constriction between the head and body, a margin or border is an edge, an angle is a bend, a ramus is a branch off of the body, a condyle is a smooth rounded articular surface, a facet is a small flattened articular surface, and for projections we have a process which is a prominent projection, a tubercle which is a small rounded bump, a tuberosity which is a knob, a trochanter which is a tuberosity on the proximal femur, and an epicondyle which is near or above the condyle. Ridges we have line or linea, and this is going to be a low ridge. A crest or crista is a prominent ridge. And a spine is a very high ridge. Openings, we have the foramen, which is a hole. A canal or meatus is a tunnel. A fissure is a cleft and a sinus or labyrinth is a cavity. And then depressions, we have fossas, and that's a general term for a depression. We have a notch, which is a depression in a bone margin. And we have a fovea, which is a little pit. And then we have a groove or sulcus, which is a deeper, narrow depression. I have another video which shows these terms along with uh, a sample of each of the terms. So you might want to watch that. Okay, the skeleton is made up of axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton, as you can see here in uh, turquoise, is made up of the skull, the vertebral column, and the sacrum and the rib cage and uh, the sternum and also the hyoid bone which is not shown here so skull hyoid bone vertebral column um, and again the vertebral column includes the sacrum and then the thoracic or rib cage which includes the sternum the appendicular skeleton, as you can see here, refers to the appendages. So that is going to include your uh, limbs, your arms and your legs, and your girdles, which includes your shoulder girdle or pectoral girdle, and your uh, pelvic girdle. And if you notice, the pelvic girdle is composed of the coxal bones. Okay, they are part of the appendicular skeleton. And now let's take a look at the human skull. The human skull is made up of two divisions. We have 14 facial bones and we have eight cranial bones. Now the cranial bones are going to make up the cranial vault and the cranial vault houses and protects the brain. Now, the skull is not totally solid. Uh, besides the different cavities that hold the brain, 
and like the nasal cavity there are also some other cavities uh, within the skull and these would be known as the paranasal sinuses now the function of the paranasal sinus is to decrease the weight of the skull and it also acts as a resonating chamber if you've ever noticed when your sinuses are plugged up you tend to sound a little bit different okay now the names of the sinuses are the frontal sinus and again, those are the sinuses in the forehead. So if you get sinus pain and your front of your forehead hurts, that's what's being filled up and uh, not draining is that frontal sinus. The next sinus is the maxillary sinus, and that's kind of in the cheek area. And um, that's a, it's a pretty large sinus and um, so if your your pain is kind of in the cheek area under the eyes that would be the maxillary sinus the next one is the ethmoid sinus and the ethmoid sinuses are located kind of in the corners of the eyes or just above the corners of the eyes and so if you have that sinus headache and you're kind of squeezing the bridge of your nose that's where the ethmoid sinuses are going to be found and now if we look at a mid sagittal section of the skull again we can see the frontal sinus right here but then the next uh, one that we're going to see is the sphenoidal sinus so right here is the sphenoidal sinus so let's take a look at a skull that has been sectioned mid sagittally and here of course we can see the frontal sinus Here's the sphenoidal sinus. And the maxillary sinus and the ethmoid sinuses we're not going to be able to really see in this view. So let's take a look at the major bones of the skull and here's just a basic look. In this skull, which is color-coded, we can see the frontal bone. On the sides are going to be the parietal, and this would be the top sides, um, will be the parietal. Next we have the sphenoidal. Then we have the zygomatic. Then the nasal bones, then the maxilla, and finally the mandible. Let's take a look at these bones from a lateral view. Here's the frontal bone. Next is the parietal bone. Then we have the temporal bone. Some people pronounce that temporal. That's also a correct pronunciation, temporal, temporal. Then we have the occipital bone in the back of the head. And here's part of the sphenoid bone. Now the sphenoid bone is going to bridge both sides of the skull. And it's going to have kind of a butterfly or moth shape to it. And so think of moths or butterflies. What do they have? They have wings. This happens to be the greater wing of the sphenoid. Again, here's the zygomatic in orange. The lacrimal bone in the eye. Lacrima means tear. And so this is kind of in the area where tears would form. Okay, or I should say, this is the area where the tears would drain. Um, tears actually form in the upper outer quadrant of the the eye, and uh, we'll we'll discuss that later. So this is more where the tears would drain to. And then here's the nasal bone, and here's the maxilla and the mandible.
Looking at a rear view of the skull, and we have the parietal bones on each side. We have the temporal bones on each side, and then the occipital bone. And we can see the mandible here. Now let's take a look at the major bones of the skull, a little more in-depth look. Again, here's the frontal bone. Here's the zygomatic. Here's the nasal bone. Here's the maxilla. Here's the mandible. And then looking inside the nose, we can see what's called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. And below that is the vomer. Now the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the vomer are what are going to make up what we call the bony septum of the nose. And it divides the right and left nasal cavities. Now here I just want to jump in and take a look at the nasal septum. Here is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. This entire bone right here is part of the ethmoid. Crystagalli, part of the ethmoid. Right here would be the cribriform plate with the olfactory foramina. Uh, but this is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Down here is the vomer. Okay, so the vomer. And you can see that the vomer is kind of a, a wedge-shaped bone. So when you look in through the nose of the skull, you'll see up at the top, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, and at the bottom, the vomer. And then if we throw in some septal cartilage, this is going to make up the complete nasal septum. But again, what makes up the bony nasal septum is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the vomer. So once again, the nasal septum divides the nasal cavity to its right and left sides, formed by the vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and also the septal cartilage. Now, sometimes this can deviate from uh, the midline and we call that a deviated septum. And it's a developmental abnormality or it can happen after trauma. Let's take a lateral view, and we can see the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, the occipital, the sphenoid, the zygomatic, here's the lacrimal, nasal, maxilla, and mandible. Looking at the back of the skull, again we have the, the two parietal bones and then the occipital bone. Now let's take the skull, we're going to remove the jaw and look uh, up underneath uh, the skull here and uh, you can see the upper teeth and uh, here we have the maxilla. Then we have the palatine bone, which goes across toward the back, um, just uh, posterior to the maxilla. Here's the occipital bone, the temporal bone, the vomer, the sphenoid, again, the sphenoid is going to go all the way across. And let's go ahead and take a look at the inside. So we're going to take that skull, cut the top of it off, and look directly inside the skull. So this is where the brain would sit.
and we can see again the frontal bone, the occipital bone, the temporal bone, and the ethmoid is kind of plugged in between um, the parts of the frontal bone. And here's part of the sphenoid. Now the sphenoid actually is all of this. See how it crosses all the way over. It's going to give this this butterfly appearance. Now here we're looking at a mid-sagittal section of the skull and again we can see the frontal bone the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital bones. Here's the sphenoid and the mandible and the maxilla. And here's the nasal bone. And now if we turn the skull around and look into the the eye or the orbit, we can see again the frontal bone, the zygomatic, the maxilla, and you can see here the maxilla comes out. So all of this is maxilla. Okay. The lacrimal, the ethmoid, and the sphenoid. Now there is a little bit of palatine bone that you can see in the orbit. However, in this particular um, skull, it's, it's very difficult to see. So, uh, but just know that there would be just a little sliver of ethmoid in there. Now I do have another video that teaches you how to memorize um, the bones of the orbit and um, he gives a little mnemonic uh, to help you to remember. So make sure you watch that video as well. Let's take a look at the sutures of the skull. The sutures of the skull are where the skull bones come together. And they're called sutures because, well, they look like they are stitched or sutured together. And uh, we have specific names for these sutures. So let's take a look at some of the major sutures. This right here is the coronal suture. Remember, a coronal section is going to divide um, an object uh, into, or in the body, into a front and a back. And so here's the coronal suture, which divides the front from the back of the um, calvera here. Here's the squamosal suture. Now, this is the temporal bone. Okay, so all of this is the temporal bone. So it's tempting to call this the temporal suture. But if you look at this portion of the temporal bone, what shape is it? It's, it's, it's uh, kind of oval, it's kind of flat. What cells did you learn that were flat in kind of this shape? They were the squamous cells. And so this is the squamous portion of the temporal bone. And so the suture going around the squamous portion of the temporal bone would be called the squamosal suture. Now, this is what we would call a sutural bone. And basically, uh, it's not going to be found in everyone. And if you do have one or more, they're going to be found in different places. It just so happens in this particular skull it formed right here. I have another skull um, where it's formed 
more in the back. And um, basically as the skull bones are coming together, because they're not fused yet as an infant, and we'll be talking about that later and why, but the, these bones are not fused yet. And so as they come together and start to fuse, that's where they form the sutures. Well, occasionally there'll be a little um, island of bone um, that's kind of developing by itself. And so when these bones come together, it just kind of creates its own little bone here. And we call that, again, a sutural bone. So it's just what we would call a normal variant. Okay, let's take a look at the back of the skull now. And we see separating the right and the left of the skull, the right and the left of the skull. Um, now, what is it, uh, what section will give us a right and a left? A sagittal section. So this is going to be the sagittal suture. Now, if you know anything about the Greek alphabet, um, there is, let's see, if we follow this, it almost looks like a, a triangle without a base. And do you know what, what letter that is in the Greek alphabet? That is lambda. And so this is going to be the lambdoidal suture. Let's take a top view of the skull now. And again, here we can see the coronal suture. Here's the sagittal suture. And here's the lambdoidal suture. Now let's take a look at bone markings of the skull, and we're going to look at each of the individual bones. Now looking at the frontal bone, again here would be the frontal bone. Um, number one here is going to be the supraorbital foramen. Now, occasionally when this is developing, because remember we put down blood vessels, we'll put down nerves and then we'll build bone around it. Sometimes during the development of this, it might be incomplete. And so instead of having a nice hole, which we call a foramen, it would just be a little nick or notch. In which case we would call it the supraorbital notch okay so you just have to kind of use your head here uh, no pun intended uh, but if you see a hole it's a foramen if you see a notch it's a notch in this case we have two supraorbital foramen okay although this was plural so we have two supraorbital foramina foramina is the plural of foramen Okay, and again, blood vessels and nerves come out through these holes. And how we name it, this is the orbit. It's above the orbit, so if it's above, it's what? Superior. It's a hole, so it's a foramen. So that's how we get the name, supraorbital foramen. Now, in between the eyes, we have kind of a lump right there, and that's called the glabella. And then next, we have these ridges or margins, and this particular one, because it's above the orbit, this would be the supraorbital ridge or supraorbital margin. And again, sometimes we get, again, that little nick or notch in that margin, and that would be the supraorbital, um, what? Notch. 
right? Superorbital notch. Looking at the lateral view, um, we're going to take a look at the temporal bone, and all of this is the temporal bone. Okay. And the first thing that we see is what's called the external auditory meatus. It can also be called the external auditory canal. So a meatus is a canal. Uh, this is basically your ear hole. Okay. That doesn't sound right, does it? Anyway, but that's your ear hole. So um, the external auditory meatus. And then you can feel on yourself behind your ear, there's going to be this lump right here. And that lump is the mastoid process. What you can't feel because it's kind of deep and you wouldn't want to be pressing on it anyway because it's kind of a sharp pointy bone and you don't want to break that off. Uh, but this is called the styloid process. You know, a stylus is, is like a pen or like if you've, you know, some uh, smartphones will have a stylus that you can use to write on it or write on a tablet with it. So uh, basically it's going to have that long, skinny, sharp point. Um, so we'll see other examples of styloid processes um, later on when we look at the rest of the skeleton. And then right here, this gets a little confusing, but this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Okay. And um, this right here, can you figure out what this is? Now, this is the zygomatic bone. So guess what this process is going to be called? This is the temporal process of the zygomatic. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Together, they form what's called the zygomatic arch. Okay, so all of this is the zygomatic arch. Um, but going back to the temporal bone, remember we talked about um, this um, flat area here, the squamous portion of the temporal bone. Another name for that is the squama. Okay, looking up under the hood here. Um, again, we're looking at the temporal bones. And so here you're going to see the mandibular fossa. Remember, a fossa is an indentation. It's a dent. This dent is where uh, the head of the mandible is going to um, ride. Okay. And then also we have right here what's called the uh, foramen lacerum. Okay, lacrimal is tear-shaped. Lacerum uh, refers to that tear shape. So foramen lacerum. And then we have what's called the carotid canal. So the carotid artery goes through there. Then we have the jugular foramen. Now, if you look at a skull, if you're able to get a hold of one and look inside, you're going to see an area that's indented um, and there, there will be a, a fossa there. So you'll first see what's called the jugular fossa, but then the hole itself is the jugular foramen. And then if we go between um, the mastoid process and the styloid process, there will be what we call a stylomastoid foramen. Now it doesn't show up real great in this picture, um, but there is a tiny little hole there that is the stylomastoid foramen. Now, looking from the top, again, we're going to then remove the top of the skull. 
And now we're looking inside again at, at the temporal bones. So obviously we can't see the temporal bones unless we remove the top of the skull to get a view inside. But uh, we're going to see again the foramen lacerum. Again, if you're able to get a hold of a, you know, a, a plastic skull, um, take a, you know, a stick, a thin stick, and place it, you know, through the foramen lacerum underneath the, the skull, and you'll see it come out on the inside of the skull. So right there, the foramen lacerum. And again, we have the carotid canal. Um, the canal is much easier to see, and right here it is on the other side. It's much easier to see on a real skull. Okay, so on an actual skull, um, you'll see that it is a canal as opposed to um, a foramen. Sometimes it's called the carotid foramen, um, but it really is more of a canal. And then down here is the jugular foramen. And if you look at this, especially if you have a skull, you know, in front of you where you can see this more three dimensionally, it's kind of shaped like a rock. Another word for rock is, is Petrus. Like the word Peter means rock. Petrus means rock. If you're petrified, you, you're like turned to stone. You, you're not going to move. Okay. So this here is called the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Same thing here, petrous portion of the temporal bone. Okay, we've moved in just a little bit uh, closer. And again, we can see the foramen lacerum, the jugular foramen, the petrous portion, of the temporal bone and then if we have an external auditory meatus well we also have an internal auditory meatus again a little difficult to see on this skull but it's right there and right there and now flipping the skull upside down we're going to take a look at the occipital bone and so this is the inferior view on the external portion of the skull. And this is going to be the occipital bone. And we see this big hole right there, and that hole is the foramen magnum. On either side of the foramen magnum, we see the occipital condyles. Now what attaches there is the first neck bone. Okay, so another technical term for the neck bone is going to be the cervical vertebrae and that first cervical vertebrae or c1 we call that oh what's that guy that holds up the earth on his shoulders in mythology atlas well this is your earth or your globe and so the very first vertebrae is going to be called the atlas and it attaches to, or rides on, I guess I should say, um, these occipital condyles. And then in the back of your head, you have kind of a lump. Now it's larger in males than females, but that lump is called the external occipital protuberance, or EOP. Another term is an ineon, which sounds kind of weird because it sticks out. I would rather call it an audion but they don't let me make up the names. So the EOP or external occipital protuberance, and then the other name is the ineon. Now there are some lines that uh, neck muscles attach to. Now the term for neck is nuchal. And so this one right here is the superior nuchal line, and this is the inferior nuchal line. Now, before you get confused with the superior and the inferior, you have to make sure you look at the way this skull is oriented. Okay, because uh, this right here faces downward, in which case 
this would be more inferior to this in its natural position. Okay, so don't let it confuse you that we have the skull tipped up and looking up. Um, that can be a little bit confusing. So if the skull were down the way it should be, then this would be the inferior nuchal line and this would be the superior nuchal line. Now, one thing I never really mentioned was all these bumps and lines and depressions and all of that. Um, especially, let's go with the, the, the bumps and the lines. These things form because muscles are attached to them and they're constantly pulling on the bone. When you pull on the bone, it's going to create a little extra bone to grow. Okay, this is kind of how heel spurs happen. Um, that's one way you don't want uh, extra bone to grow. But that's what happens when the periosteum, the covering around the bone, becomes um, irritated. Um, it starts to produce some more bone to give uh, a little bit of slack there to take some of the pressure off. Unfortunately, what happens, you start to grow some bone, you're standing on it, it's sharp, it causes more inflammation, and so it makes more bone. Well, this is what happens naturally, you know, not in um, an inflammatory process, but just the natural pull on the bone will create these bumps and knobs and ridges that we see and that you have to name. Okay, looking back on the inside of the skull again, we're going to take a look at the ethmoid bone. So this is the internal view. And the one thing you see is this is called the cribriform plate. This whole plate right here is the cribriform plate. Cribriform means it's full of holes, and this is. Now those little holes are what we call olfactory foramina. And those are the holes for cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. Now olfaction is the sense of smell. So these little nerves, they go through that cribriform plate, through the olfactory foramina, and the little nerve endings are what are going to detect odorants. Okay, and of course they, they come up through that olfactory foramina and um, they're going to eventually make a connection with the brain. I'm not going to go into detail about it because uh, we will go into detail when we get to special senses. Um, but just to let you know that uh, that's where cranial nerve one is. Yeah, so remember that. So when we do get to special senses uh, toward the end of the semester, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then we have this little thing sticking up, this, this ridge or crista, and this is the crista galley. Okay, crista galley. I think the other term for crista is spine. So it is kind of a sharp, spiny thing sticking up, um, but that's the crystic galley. Still looking at the ethmoid, from the anterior view, we see um, the uh, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, and that forms the superior part of the nasal septum. Now underneath is the vomer. The vomer is not part of the ethmoid. I put it in there anyway, just because when you look in the nose, the bottom bone is the vomer. That's, that's its own bone. Um, but what attaches to it is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. So that's right there. Also, when you look in the nose, you're going to see these, what are called nasal conch. Okay, and here is the middle nasal conch. And the middle nasal conch, um, well, we have an inferior nasal conch here, a middle nasal conch here. The superior nasal conch, we're not able to see unless we split the skull in half, then we can see it. And I'll show you that in just a moment. 
Um, but the inferior nasal conch is not part of the ethmoid bone. You still need to know it, though, that this is the inferior, middle, and then I'll show you superior in a moment, nasal conch. But again, if I show you an intact skull, or if you see an intact skull on an exam, make sure you know that this is not the superior nasal conch. It is the middle nasal conch. Okay, here we have a, a skull split in half. And let's see, right there is the superior nasal conch. So superior, middle, inferior, nasal conch. Okay. Again, the inferior is not part of the ethmoid, but just showing you anyway. And remember I said the Christigalli kind of comes up and is kind of a, a spine or almost a ridge. Um, that's the Christigalli. Now looking at the sphenoid from the interior view, we have the uh, foramen ovale, and then we have the foramen spinosum. And then right here we have what's called the cella tersica. The cella tersica means Turk's saddle. So in the old days when they named these, this looked like a Turkish saddle. The Turkish saddle has a very high front and a very high back. So that is the Sela Tersica or Turkish saddle. Now, I know I don't have this listed here, but the seat of the saddle is what we call the hypophyseal fossa. Another word for hypothesis, not hypothesis, but hypothesis, pH, is um, the old term for the pituitary gland. So this is where your pituitary gland sits. It sits right there in the saddle. Okay. Now other parts of the sphenoid, we have the greater wing. Again, on each side, the greater wing. And then... Um, we also have the lesser wing right here and here. So a wing here, a wing here. Wing, wing. Hello? No, anyway. So greater wing, lesser wing. And then let's look at the um, sphenoid from the lateral view. Kind of keep this in mind here, this, this greater wing. If we go from the lateral view there's the greater wing once again. Okay, going back inside, um, we are going to see the foramen rotundum. We're going to see the optic foramen. This is where the optic nerve goes through and attaches to your eyeball. And again, the lesser wing and the greater wing of the sphenoid. Looking from the anterior view, again, still looking at the sphenoid, because remember the sphenoid crosses all the way over. Okay, it's going to look like a butterfly or a, or even a, uh, an owl. And I do have another video that will show the major bones um, in an animation form where you know i can make the other bones clear and you can see just the entire bone so make sure you watch that as well as another video that is a review to help you learn these bones where i'll give you some mnemonics uh, to help you memorize some of these holes and and gaps and um, you know fissures and what have you so again we have i have three videos on the skull. So this one and two others. Uh, so make sure you watch those because the skull can be uh, rather tricky. And it's just three different ways um, to help you reinforce the different uh, parts of the skull.
Again, looking from the front view, we can see the optic frame. And again, you know, the eyeball sits here. The optic nerve comes out and attaches to the eyeball. And then we have these gaps or fissures. So here's the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. Still on the sphenoid, we're going to tip the skull upward and think back to, you know, if you studied about dinosaurs, what were those dinosaurs um, that flew around? They had the big long beaks and the great big wings. Oh yeah, pterodactyls. Terry, right here, Terry, P-T-E-R-Y, means wing. So that's where a pterodactyl, dactyl refers to fingers, so a pterodactyl is a wing finger. Well, how about bats? Bats are wing fingers, right? But we can't use the term pterodactyl because that's already been taken. Um, there would be lawsuits, attorneys would be going back and forth. Um, uh, so we use the term chiroptera, chiroptera, okay? So it still has the terra in there, okay, for wing. Chiro means hand. So bats are chiropteras, which means hand wing. The point I'm getting at is terra means wing, okay? And so, again, it's a little easier to see on a real skull, but this flares out kind of like a wing, okay? And this flares out as well. Again, it doesn't show up too well on this one. This shows up better. But this right here doesn't show up as well. But that will also stick out like a wing. And so we have the lateral pterygoid process here and here. And then we have the medial pterygoid processes here and here.